I love racing. I can hardly sleep about two days before the race. My adrenaline starts pumping and I get worried because I can't sleep at night. You know, you think you're not competitive, but once you're on the river with all the other racers, that little edge comes out. With all these seven boys or canoe teams that are enrolled, I like to go and beat the pants off of them. We always say there's room in the boat for everyone, and that means not everyone has to be a great, strong paddler. It's not like, let's go, let's go, let's go. It's not a big panic. It's a, uh, they're a good bunch of women. It might be different come race day. <laughs> This race gets bigger and bigger every year, and this year we have 168 paddlers from six countries. Uh, England. Texas. Texas. Dallas. From Lethbridge, Alberta. Uh, 19. Oh. 23. Yeah. I've come from the UK, three of us. There's just one uh, paddler, solo kayaker. We're doing it for a charity in England. My goals this year are to keep the blades turning, high RPM, and try to knock some time off the record. Are we competitive? Are we competitive? No. We just want to finish. First. <laughs> That's more like it. Well, as a Brit, I hope it keeps raining, because then everybody else will be a disadvantage and we'll be fine. I've got quite a lot of experience with my background in the military itself. We're from the, the British Army. We're going to give it our best shot. If I get too tired, I've asked them to just kind of dump me overboard for a bit. <laughs> and then I'll crawl back in the boat and paddle some more. How you doing? Good. Yeah. I see you still Don't chewing gum. Still chewing gum. I'm getting stronger all the time, so hopefully I'll be an asset to them and not a hindrance in the boat. It's very, very much a group effort in paddling in a Voyager canoe. It's not one person, it's eight people. And that boat will be as efficient as that group can interact with one another. It's my first year of ever doing anything like this. It's my first time ever of doing anything like this, so I don't know what to expect, but I'm hyped for anything. <laughs> Whatever happens, happens. We are Travelers of Rest! Washington, Texas, New York, California, Hawaii, Michigan, Iowa, Georgia, Wisconsin, Florida, Maine, and Illinois, and of course, our dearest and closest neighbors from Alaska. We have competitors from England, Scotland, Channel Island, Austria, Australia, and Belize.
brain and my muscles just throbbed something awful. Maybe I was really sore and feeling sick because, you know, maybe I shouldn't even be out there yet, you know? That was running through my head. When you're sick, you've got no control. Whatever they say you do, take this pill, take this needle at two o'clock, you take that needle at two o'clock. Just the power of being able to go for coffee. Oh, well, you can't really go for coffee that particular day because your immune system is so low that that it's just, you, it would be really silly for you to get out into the public. For me to actually get sick, it's just not like me. I'm never sick. Oh, come get your ball, here. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the one out there that's working like a man and running graders and dozers. I can run a 28 P&H shovel. There's three flights of stairs to, to get up to that shovel seat, you know? That's a big shovel. To think that I had the power to do that and didn't, didn't have control over my own body to go for coffee. Pretty wild. I found my lump totally by accident with the inside of my arm. Just as I was just sitting on the sofa and leaning over and I kind of did this movement and I thought, gee, what's that? And I did it again and then I put my hand there and I thought, oh my God, that doesn't belong there. And I just went for long walks and I didn't say anything to Doug because I didn't want to scare him and I didn't actually want to put a voice to what I was thinking. That word actually uh, came to me on a Thursday. It was November 17th and I don't think I'll ever forget um, that day and how your life changes instantly. When you're paddling a race like the Yukon River Quest, you're also right pitted right there against nature, and anything can happen. Just got caught in the crosswinds and the and the waves. I've been submerged for ten minutes. That's that's why I'm shaking. And how are the paddlers abreast doing? We had headwinds, we had like thunderstorms, and it was just, it was horrible. Hardly had breaks because we were cold, so we just wanted to keep out. I had we were sort of hoping, okay, the sun will come out, maybe we can dry. I came out, teased us a little bit, dried off a little bit, and then the rain started again. So that was kind of hard to take. There is like rollers on Lake La Barge. That's the worst I've ever had to paddle on Lake La Barge and all the river quests I've been in. It just seemed like you could look for, uh, for the furthest point on the lake and you know that when you got to that point, you, could, you would have to look at the next furthest point. And then you, when you paddled to that, you were looking at the next furthest point and it just seemed like hours went by before you actually got off of Lake La Barge. We're here. 
I just don't want to get back into a soaking wet boat with dry clothes on, so I'm mopping before I get out. Um, I'm just going to be stripping down here. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> well, if you don't mind. Fruits and vegetables. And, and there's buns over there, Claire. So grab a bun. I've been out in worse, but I've been in a covered boat with a toilet and a furnace, you know? <laughs> I got one pair of dry pants left. And hopefully the thunder doesn't bring more rain. Well, I think, you know, if the weather improves, it'll be a great trip. <laughs> Done the lake, it's behind us. We've only have how many kilometers to go? <laughs> yeah, still a few kilometers to go, but this is always the hardest part. To get over that, once we're on the river, it's a piece of cake. Sort of. <laughs> we were dry for maybe a half hour and completely soaked within an hour. It broke records the amount of rainfall since 1953 or something. I can remember when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, how pissed off I was that, uh, that my body had let me down. I was wondering, you know, what did I do wrong? I was taking care of my body. I was active. I was exercising. I was eating what I thought was right. I just never thought I would get cancer, breast cancer. My first reaction was total denial. This just cannot be happened to me, happening to me. I'm not going to read that book because you're going to get those results back and you're going to see that it's not me. And even when I went in for surgery, I was saying, if you can, do, you know, if you can just take the lump, just just take the lump, okay? <laughs> they humored me and said, yeah, that, that they would do that. But and they knew, but they knew that, you know, that the whole the whole breast had to come off. So. The person that I had the most difficult time telling was my mother. I've often wondered why that was so difficult. I talked to my brothers and sisters. We have a very close family. And I think that really I just couldn't deal at that particular time. I couldn't deal with thinking about her fear for me. Guys are awesome. Oh, I feel more awesome when I'm clean and dry. Yeah. <laughs> Go Claire. Go Liz. It's been tough so far. I yeah, it's the toughest, toughest uh, of the four times I've done it. This is the toughest I've ever been. I want to paddle with them for the endurance to prove to myself that I'm capable. I'm getting my strength back. I look at Elena, she's coming along very closely after her treatment. Um, she's obviously a strong-willed person, she was, but it's difficult. This is, this is a difficult project for her.
Yes, let's go sleep. Let's go eat and sleep. Yes. I just gotta get my gear. My gear. Yeah, my gear. My gear, I know. I got fear in the brain. Oh, I'm so glad we're in CarMax. It's really great being greeted by our support team, our families, and our oh, friends. I'm going to go to bed and sleep, and I'm going to go and eat. But we're still in the race. We're, we're going on. I always say that the race doesn't start until CarMax, because CarMax is really the turning point for a lot of racers. We've had about 15 scratches total, which is about average for the race, but it's, they've all happened a lot earlier. And then the water came into the log jam, and so we went to go between the two, and the current was way faster than we thought it was going to be, and it pushed us into that. I was and then caught in one I of I ducked underneath, and it got Carla in the stomach, and then kind of started sinking the boat. And then I popped Where? out, and Carla popped out, and then it got... You can't have a safety boat at every minute of the day watching you, and, and you just have to rely on other teams to help until help comes. We've been dubbed the mothership. We got enough, we got enough food in there for a five-star hotel and um, extras of, it, you always put extras of, of, of clothes or food or socks or anything in because there's, there's going to be somebody that needs it along the way, so. <laughs> oh my goodness, you're so cute, Molly. I almost quit last night. I, I, uh, it was really hard work, and it was, the rain and my muscles just throbbed something awful. <laughs> Once we got talking about it, everybody felt the same way. Everybody's muscles were sore, and four just felt like throwing up. Oh, I just don't feel very well. Just very stomach sick, very nauseous, one to barf. We put a lot of energy into that chunk of the trip. I hope we got enough energy to get us the rest of the way. We will get the point to the point where we can't go any further. So I believe that's when you have support from others to say you keep going and you don't give up. really hard to ask for help. It was just not something I'm used to doing, you know, like laying flooring. You just get in there and do it. <laughs> and to, to ask for help, it's, uh, yeah, that's pretty hard. He took some extra time off just so he could take care of me. I was really lucky because not everybody is cut out for peeling bandages off and looking at incisions, you know. I was really lucky that he was able to do that for me. And sometimes the people that's the closest to you is the one you take everything out on. I would never begrudge Lem a game of golf <laughs> with his friends. <laughs> I told her not to worry about like when she stops paddling and stuff like that. Cause she I just get she's... so sore and I don't want to be a burden. You know, I want to... I, I've, I've had to stop lots. Okay. Yeah, but just because I, to I told her that's my job to go on and complain. That's my job in the boat. <laughs> that's all I do. <laughs> I think she's pretty brave to tackle it, you know. And she had a bad, bad year last year. And, uh, and uh, if she can handle it, it's good therapy. Even when you come to a point where you're tired, you can't... That's okay. That's allowed. That's to be expected. And you will go to the next to the next level. And she is. And now that she sees it, she's gone. She will keep going to the next level. That's part of what the Paddles of Breast is trying to help women with. It's far removed. I mean, paddling a boat is not the same as getting on with your life. But if you can do that, then you can transfer it to other areas of your life. And it really is true. It really is. I wasn't going to finish the race, but I'm going to try. Oh. 
think it's much more exciting, I think, between CarMax and Dawson City. The river really picks up a lot of speed. We're going 16, Katie. Woo! So the water totally loses that really beautiful kind of bluey green color and it just becomes muddy and silty and it moves a lot faster. You can hear the silt on the bottom of the canoe. It makes a really kind of um, like a tingling sound. Uh, then the last anesthetic I was on, uh, or that I had to have, gave me uh, anesthetically induced asthma. So my lungs are tender. <laughs> but I'm hoping with time that'll all, you know, they weren't good to begin with, but I'm hoping that it'll resolve itself a little bit because I was never this bad. I first came to the Yukon in 1971. A girlfriend and I decided to go north, young women go north, and fell in love with the place. My business name is uh, Claire Demare Woodworking, and the little project I'm working on right now is uh, just some plywood uh, shells for the Mount Lawrence Volunteer Fire Department. And I have to make sure that the corners are nice and smooth because uh, volunteer firefighters are pretty picky. They wouldn't want to get slivers. Uh, it might hurt them a little bit. With Claire's skill in cabinet making and I guess my skills with the computer assisted design, we hope to incorporate uh, a bit further the uh, avenues of what we can offer people as far as woodworking skills. And we can do it at home. And I guess that's the other thing. We can spend more time together. We've built everything that you see on this property by ourselves, so uh, we can't think of any other place other than the spot on the Watson River to call home. There's a road that carry us home. We are called the river alone, made of tears and curves. Flesh and bone, oh, we build this boat to carry us home. There's a roll in the air. she pulls us along, she is deep and mighty, stirring and strong. Oh, we ride with her, we sing her song, oh, we build this boat to carry us home.
my son, who was five years old, and he was diagnosed with uh, metastatic Ewing sarcoma, and that's bone cancer of the spine, which spread to his lungs. They said that he had a tumor on his spine, and that if they didn't remove it, he would be paralyzed within 24 hours. And I thought, oh my God, this is not happening. It was like it was in a surreal world. And uh, so, and they said after they removed it, there was no guarantee he was going to walk again. And uh, so they removed it. And the next day, the next morning, Christian was standing up by his bed. So I guess it goes to show he's a bit de determination, I guess, and the stubbornness of him that kept him going and kept him alive. He went through many surgeries and he had like chemo and radiation and then he had uh, a stem cell transplant. Two years after Christian was finished, we took a, a deep breath and things were going well health-wise and work-wise and family-wise. And then I was feeling ill. I went to my doctor and I said, I kind of feel sick. I can't miss Christian's checkups in Vancouver. Can you just, just help me out? By the way, I found a lump and we will deal with it when I get back. And she said, oh, no, 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 we'll deal with it now. And the next thing I know, he was in one end of the, the, the hospital and I was in the other end. I was 28 years old when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was. Hey, buddy. Yeah. Just we did it. We did it. We stuck together and helped each other out in the good times and bads and knock on wood that everything did go good for us and I still got my son and my wife with me. I'm a very proud man. That's a rock, and because we're moving, the rock looks like it's moving. <laughs> oh, dear, dear, dear. <laughs> concerned for my daughter. I had no family background, but I know that it now ups her chances. That does concern me. When I first got the diagnosis, which was over the telephone, by the way, and is not a good way to get the diagnosis, um, I kind of sat down for about 20 minutes and had 20 minutes of palpitations and, and heavy breathing, and then that was it. Then it's time to get information, find out what you need to do, get busy at it mastectomy, chemotherapy. I was off work for a while, got to play the bald head thing for a while, but I did also have three kids to raise. My husband had made his exit a couple of years before, so I had the three kids and a full-time job and breast cancer. So it was an uh, interesting time. One episode when my white count was really down low, my daughter came home with the flu, I got the flu, and the two of us we're lying on the mattress on the floor, you know, just sicker than sick. They're making advances in, in the medications and the treatments. She's 20 now. Maybe when it's her time, it will not be as big a, as big as a deal as for, as for me. My oldest boy, Jesse, was somewhat aware of what was going on. I think he was, I'm sure he was eight. And he would come in to my room when I'd be just kind of 
meditating and he'd say, can I do that with you? And I'd say, sure. He said, what do you do? And I said, well, you know, like when you watch Pac-Man and you have that little guy who goes around and he eats up things. I said, you think about that and that little thing is going around and eating up the bad things in my body, sort of like good over evil. And it was something he could understand because he knew about Pac-Man. So he'd lie down on bed with me and we'd just close our eyes and imagine this. I really loved that. That was a nice sharing I had with him. You get on the water and everything just sort of blows all that negative energy off you and you feel fantastic. It rejuvenates you. It's therapeutic in many respects to be on the water. You just experience this flow. It's like everybody gets into into sync with each other and you just you just move. Everything becomes really fluid and you're so a part of the river and so much a part of your surroundings. It's like a beautiful experience. got back to my commitment to health and fitness. That was how I decided to deal with having the best chance at both prevention and if I did have a reoccurrence, being in the best possible shape I could be in to battle it a uh, second time around. I was always a tomboy. I grew up on the prairies and spent absolutely as much time outside as I could. Um, when I graduated from high school, at that point, I already knew I wanted to go up north. After going to college and taking a recreation technology program, we actually did move up north and absolutely loved it. The north was everything I thought it was going to be. I loved the mountains and the rivers and the trails and the wilderness and uh, have enjoyed it for getting close to 30 years now. So. Uh, I absolutely love the North. I think it's the best place anyone could live. So maybe you can dig right here. Toddlers are my passion. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm cut out for. Yeah. They don't talk back at that age. So. One of the things I like doing in this community is volunteering with the fire department. I sort of view these women as women that really embrace life in a major, major way, and they don't take anything for granted at all. It's like they totally live in the moment. You can feel the strength when we're in the boat, and you know, you need that kind of incredible strength when you're 55 hours into a race and your muscles are aching and you're in pain and you can't stand eating anymore. I always tell myself when I'm in the canoe that I will dare not whine on my way to Dawson City. Like it's just, you know, because I'm, I'm in the company of women that uh, are very positive, they're really optimistic. They have a great sense of humor. I've had some really good laughs with the women when we're in the canoe together. I had to put it back on. I was getting a draft in one ear and out the other, and it was making a whistle and noise. <laughs> No, the wind, wind was going in 
in one ear and out the other and making a whistling noise, and I couldn't keep time to the paddling. So I had to put my hat on and stop the wind from going through. <laughs> <laughs> Elena's got a wonderful sense of humor, that girl, though. She just, some of the things she says in that boat, you just, it just cracks you up. And you're out there paddling in that wind, just grunting away, and she's, oh, I need something greasy. I need poutine. I need sausages. I need, you know, and all our health foods people in the back are turning green with it. I need grease, she says. <laughs> she just, she's funny. It's an endurance race and you wear your body down to a certain point and, and you start to have visions. I saw tigers on the shores of the Yukon River. They were roaring tigers. And I saw an old woman with children and, and she looked like she'd come from the Klondike. She had her old clothes on and she had all these children and she had the saddest face on her. And I looked her right in the eye and she looked me right back. And to me, she was real. It was pretty neat, the hallucinations, but on the other side, it was kind of scary too because I didn't recognize myself in experiencing those hallucinations. with my body now. In a year's time, I might change my mind. <laughs> I'm lucky my husband is just glad I'm here painting for him. <laughs> I went to art school. And that really is what I love, what I love to do most. When I woke up in the hospital after my operation, Doug had brought me a beautiful little delicate feminine little top, you know, that gift said so much to me. <laughs> Just because you don't have one of your breasts, it's still okay. <laughs> I think the stern paddlers really have to stay on their toes. 
You know, some parts of the river are so vast, little islands and there's slow channels and fast channels and like really you have to pay attention to your maps. When you're in the boat with them, there's really nothing to be scared of. And I know they've been doing this for years. They've been there before me in a lot of ways, not just in paddling. So I get a lot of comfort from them. It's good just to have someone, someone who listens. And I do lots of that. It's a privilege to just come alongside somebody. I know when I was waiting for my surgery, uh, and I didn't have to wait very long, but the one thing I really wanted to hear about was I wanted to hear the positive stories. I wanted to hear about the women that had gone through all this and they were fine and they had grandchildren and, you know, had gotten on with their lives. That's what I wanted to hear about. And we feel that in the boat all the time. You know, some of these women, they're 10 years uh, since their breast cancer. So I'm just, just a little over a year. So it's... Um, there's hope. <laughs> There's hope that I won't get, uh, you know, it won't show up somewhere else. I think the spirit of the boat is really what we race for. We really want to remember and honor those women that didn't make any mistakes, they didn't make any bad decision. It's just a bad disease, and some people survive and some don't. Edith wasn't a great, strong person, and it was easy to see what a toll it was taking on her. It was a very hard race for her. She did an amazing job. When we got to Dawson that year, we all got together in one of the motel rooms and had beer and pizza and stuff. And I looked around at, at my team and everyone's kind of lying on the beds and we're drinking beer and talking and everyone's laughing and looking happy. And I looked over at Edith and oh my God, she was just, she was floating. I have never seen anyone looking so beautiful. She was absolutely glowing from, uh, it's hard to say she was radiating and I thought, wow. <laughs> Am I ever glad she was in the boat? I know why we have a boat. I know why we go. When we were getting ready to go again, and there's Edith's husband. Edith had been cremated and he wanted to bring to us some of her ashes. And he had driven like crazy. He drove into town straight to the river and caught us as we were leaving and passed the ashes to Linda. Oh, gee. Edith in the boat again. I knew exactly where she was going. One of the most beautiful places on the river. It's nighttime and it's quiet. And we released her. And every time I go by there, I think about her.
I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. For sleeping <laughs> for so long. What did you say, Claire? I said it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> but we need somebody to sing and yeah. wake us up. But everybody can make it all. Okay. 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 shower and crawl into bed. <laughs> Can't wait. place that you don't go to too often or you're not pushed to go to too very often. And you find that spirit or that strength and courage that you have way deep inside of yourself and it's that little shining light and that's really, it's truly your human spirit. There's a rolling river Carry us home We are cold and weary But never alone Made of tears and courage Flesh and bone For we build this wall To carry us home There's a rolling river She pulls us along She is deep and mighty Oh, we ride her current, sing her song. Oh, we build this boat to carry us on. There's a rolling river to carry us home. We are called and we but never alone. Made of tears and courage, flesh and bone. Oh, we build this boat.
never alone Made of tears and courage Flesh and bone Oh, we built this boat To carry us home We built this boat To carry us home I'll get back to work Because <laughs> <laughs> what do you think this is anyway? <laughs>